David W. Reeves and John Phillips performing great band music from the classics to the contemporary. We are the American Band. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. On behalf of the University of Rhode Island Music Department and Notable Works, we thank you for attending this afternoon's special event, made possible by a Rhode Island Culture, Humanities, and Arts Recovery Grant and a Rhode Island State Council for the Arts Grant. Both are sponsors of Notable Works. And today, I'd also, Notable Works would like to thank the following performers, Dan Pedro for filling in for Antonio Rodericks as tenor, and Dal Dalin Favalli, who is substituting for Allison Shea on piano. Now, please welcome Nicole DiPaolo, who has been a dedicated environmental advocate since 2006 and is currently working on offshore wind energy with the National Wildlife Federation. the connection that has gotten through these, us through these hard COVID times and that get us through the, the climate crisis that gets worse but gets better and heals with our action. The poem that I'll share today is about being in connection to each other and to the earth and really about how challenging it can be to sustain that connection when centuries of domination have torn us apart. <clears throat> Lost and found. Some things we say quietly to ourselves. Over and over they sound the same. They would sound so differently out loud. Words and actions representing melting of all into one. Time, consequence, Yet vehicles for understanding fall short of comprehension. The only way to know anything is to let go of knowing anything. It sounds so silly, the truth so filled with everything. 
One may mistake it for empty. How could this be? Concoctions colliding, qualities constantly changing against confined boxes, boxes to encase the madness of our own creation. Labels that make life easier at the cost of making life harder. Invented because life was too hard for our ancestors to survive in. These things exist without us, just with different names. Humans chasing the subject experience of ourselves yet that fragmented reality flashes only for a moment in the heart of the universe I don't want to talk about your day or the weather unless it's taught to dissolve the particular importance of these things. Can we talk about how none of it matters and dance instead? Can we talk about how none of it matters and dance instead? Can we sing songs that somehow make sense of these cyclical mistakes? Can we sing songs that somehow make sense of these cyclical mistakes? Not with answers, but by making light of the question, making dark of the question, being one with the question, getting lost in the question, becoming the question, who am I to question, a human lost in answers that don't make sense when we are climbing an infinite staircase of regression. Too tired to go on, I'll swing from branches. Not for height, but for depth. Not for strength, but for grace, for grace. To careen through debilitating madness of our culture so-called. Can I find my place? Can I find my place? until I lose my place and surrender to the motion of change. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. At the time that David Maslanko was commissioned to write the following fanfare, titled Mother Earth, he was studying philosophical concepts that enhanced his appreciation of the power of music to promote awareness of the present, connect to our creativity, and potentially open our minds to finding solutions for ways that we are damaging the planet. This work was based upon the following short poem by the influential medieval friar, St. Francis of Assisi. Praised by you, my Lord, for our sister, Mother Earth, who nourishes us and teaches us, bringing forth all kinds of fruits and colored flowers and herbs. Here is Mother Earth by David Maslanka.
This next piece by Noreen Inglesi focuses on science and the innovative ways we can deal with the climate crisis. It was part of a collaborative project between Notable Works and the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. Here is The Earth is in Our Care.
Frank to Kelly's original text for his choral work, Earth Song, is as follows. Sing, be, live, see. This dark stormy hour, the wind it stirs, the scorched earth cries out in vain. O war and power, you blind and blur, the torn heart cries out in pain. But music and singing have been my refuge, and music and singing shall be my light. A light of song, shining strong, alleluia. Through darkness and pain and strife, I'll sing, be, live, see, peace. We now present to Kelly's setting of Earth Song for Wind Band, a prayer for us all.
Noreen Inglesi wrote this next song right after the worst part of the pandemic had finally subsided, and when things were slowly starting to return to normal. This piece emulates the theme of this event and brings out the significance of reconnecting, renewal, adaptation, and growth. Here is New Discoveries. Fabris Ver, meaning spring fever, is a variegated post-minimalist landscape that evokes the sensuous essences of spring. The aromas, colors, flavors, and oral delights of Earth's perennial rebirths are interwoven with chorale-like textures, first introduced by the brass, then playfully tossed around by the rest of the ensemble. Thank you. 
This is composer Stephen Bryant's description of his work, Bloom. Quote, it is a celebration of springtime, the bright sunny days with nature in bloom all around give me a powerful sense of well-being, simultaneously tranquil and exuberant. Bloom is my attempt to recreate that feeling, unquote.
Noreen Inglesi's song, Sunset on the Cove, was inspired by a beautiful work of art by a well-known artist, Kent Cameron, who passed away in 2019. We're very honored to have Kent's wife, Cheryl Cameron, here with us today. Kent's painting depicted two boaters rowing during a storm on Hundred Acre Cove in Barrington. This key natural habitat is preserved and protected by the Audubon Society of Rhode Island, the Barrington Land Trust, and other local environmental agencies. Here is Sunset on the Cove.
We close the first half of our program with Beyond the Horizon, a dynamic composition encompassing majestic brass fanfares and sweeping melodic lines. This piece is comprised of two themes that musically paint a picture of the Earth's breathtakingly beautiful horizon. To conduct Beyond the Horizon, please welcome the assistant conductor of the American band, Dalin Favali.
We'll now have a 10 minute intermission and hope that you will consider visiting the tables in the lobby for the American Band, the URI Music Department, the Winasquatucket River Watershed Council, Audubon Society of Rhode Island, and Notable Works. We'll be back soon.
Well, good afternoon again, and welcome to the second half of our program. Before we begin, I would just like to make a quick recognition. I know the lights have just gone off, but we are honored today to have the relatively new president of the University of Rhode Island, Dr. Mark Parlange, and his wife, Mary, who are in attendance today at the concert. So. We thank you for being here. The Audubon Society of Rhode Island was formed in 1897 and is the oldest environmental agency in our state. Their mission is to protect birds and other wildlife and their habitat through conservation, education, and advocacy for the benefit of people and all living things. We'd like to now share Notable Works' as tribute to the Audubon Society of Rhode Island.
And now at this time, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker, Priscilla De La Cruz, who is Senior Director of Government Affairs for the Audubon Society and President of the Environment Council of Rhode Island. multitask here, removing my mask. Um, I was talked to speak for about 10 minutes, um, but I don't think I'll need the entire time after that beautiful tribute to the work of the Audubon Society of Rhode Island and the introduction to our mission. Um, but I will be conscious of time here, so if you hear something going off, that is my timer, um, telling me that I've shared too much with you today. Um, so uh, thank you for having me today. Um, as mentioned, I am Priscilla De La Cruz. I am the Senior Director of Government Affairs at the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. I am new to the role. I've been there for about eight years. Um, I am continuing the amazing work of our, my predecessor, Matt Kerr. Um, and I'm here today to tell you a little bit about more about our advocacy work, um, but also when invited to speak by Noreen and Bina, um, they thought it would be a great idea for me to share with you sort of my perspective of the environmental movement, um, where we are and, and where we're going. And of course, putting into context um, my role at Audubon um, and also the work of the Audubon Society of Rhode Island um, when it comes to environmental advocacy. Um, so thank you very much to Noreen and Bina for having me today. Um, it's my pleasure. Um, I wear a few different hats, as mentioned. I am the president of the Environment Council of Rhode Island, and I will tell you a little bit more about that Environment Council in a few minutes. Um, and I am also the co-chair of Climate Jobs Rhode Island, another coalition. So first, um, continuing on that introduction to the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. So as mentioned, um, our mission is to protect birds, other wildlife, and their habitats, and we do that through conservation, education, and advocacy. And of course, advocacy brings me here today. Um, but I invite you all, um, as the program continues and after the program, um, to go visit the Audubon table. Um, my colleague, Senior Director of Development and Communications, Jeff Hall, is there. Um, and he'll be able to share with you information about how we'll be celebrating 125 years of education, conservation, and advocacy. Um, so in terms of who we are, as you've learned, um, we are a private, independent, membership-supported organization. Um, we have about 17,000 members and supporters across the state. Um, and we are devoted to improving the use, the management, and protection of all natural resources and the environment. And of course, that is for the benefit of all living things and for the benefit of people like you and I. Um, so Audubon manages about 9,500 acres of conserved habitat um, to protect the diverse ecosystem, as you saw in the beautiful images shared in that video. Um, and these are the ecosystems that we need to adapt to the climate crisis. As Nicole beautifully um, talked about in her poem um, and sang for us, the climate change crisis is here. So how are we going to face that challenge uh, in terms of mitigating the impacts of climate change and curbing our carbon emissions, but also how are we going to adapt to it and ensure that we remain resilient in the face of climate change. So that is part of the work that we try to do at Audubon and really showing nature at work in showing that um, we can lead the walk um, and share um, with uh, you all, with other land conservation owners um, and with policymakers as to how we can adapt um, to climate change by protecting ecosystems and protecting wildlife. So Audubon's strategic plan was adopted in 2020, um, shortly before I came on to join the team. And that Audubon, um, that recent Audubon strategic plan that lays out the vision between 2020 to 2025 really weaves in the climate change crisis into every aspect of our work, um, whether it is conservation, again, how do we do that work of protecting um, these vulnerable ecosystems um, for the benefit of wildlife and all living things? How do we talk about the climate change crisis in our education program and ensure that there's climate change literacy um, for, for everyone in our future generations to understand um, how they can thrive in this new environment as we work to solve the climate change crisis. And of course, through our advocacy work. 
How are we going to position the work that we do at the state house to really ensure that we're working hand in hand with policymakers to address the climate crisis and implement solutions that are going to get us the um, drastic emission reductions that we need to respond and do our part. Of course, this is not only a national but also a global issue when we're talking about climate change. But what can Rhode Island do um, to really show that we can we can lead by example and face the climate change crisis, but also create a new sustainable economy. So in terms of our climate change, um, our strategic plan that really um, centers the climate change crisis, um, we looked at four, four buckets. First, um, how do we protect birds and their habitat to support, to support species survival and adaptation through climate change, as I've mentioned. The second, which I think is really um, important and I think um, really sustains me as an advocate and gives me optimism, um, is what I'm doing here today. <laughs> How do we work together and mobilize people um, from all different walks of life to really not only understand the climate crisis, but to also take action? And I think that that's where the inspiration is, as Nicole said. Um, how are we in this together? How are we going to respond to it? And how are we going to mobilize around climate action? Third, um, which is my role at Audubon, how do we advocate for local and state government to rapidly invest in climate crisis responses? And I think in looking at that third bucket within our strategic plan, Audubon really recognizing that not one individual, not one organization, not one coalition can do this work on its own. Really that it has to be a movement um, and that's why coalition building is really critical to really ensuring that we're passing effective climate policy. And I will talk about that more in a couple of minutes. Um, and lastly, how do we transform Audubon into an inclusive climate action organization? So over the past few years, especially through all the pandemic, recognize that there are communities of marginalized backgrounds that have been overburdened by pollution and that, carry, that are carrying more of that brunt than they have contributed to the climate change crisis. So how do we ensure that the movement is not only inclusive, but that we're also supporting efforts that really respond to the needs of those communities that are overburdened by pollution? And I'll talk a little bit more about as to how we're doing our part in that work. So I want to shift gears to talk about um, what led to something pretty significant taking place last year in Rhode Island. Um, for a number of years, um, we had been working to pass um, climate change legislation, and that's a good reminder, so I know where I'm at. Um, so we had been working for a number of years with other partners in the climate movement to pass climate change legislation, specifically what we now know as the Act on Climate that really sets the state on a path towards reducing carbon emissions and getting to net zero by 2050. But I think even more importantly are the interim targets of responding to the climate change crisis. How are we going to reduce carbon emissions 45% um, um, by 2030 below 90 1990 levels. How are we going to get to 80% by 2040? So last year, a policymakers and the environmental community came together to really show a unified front, and that bill became law. It was also very significant in that piece of legislation as the state is working to create a plan to update a plan by the end of this year and to then create strategic plans moving forward every five years is that it's going to center around environmental justice communities and the labor movement as well. So really recognizing that the climate change crisis um, not only needs to center around strong, robust stakeholder engagement to ensure that those communities, their needs are met, but that they're also at the table um, in that decision-making table as we're crafting those solutions because frontline workers and frontline communities are most impacted. And then of course, we all benefit from those solutions. And when I talk about environmental justice communities, um, they tend to be communities of color, black, indigenous, people of color, as I mentioned, and also low-income communities and disabled communities that are facing that overburden exposure to pollution. 
So if you want to learn more about that, um, I encourage you to visit our website, asri.org, and under the news section, um, the newsletter that we publish to communicate our advocacy issues is Eagle Eye, um, and there we'll keep you abreast as to what the state is doing. Um, there are a number of public sharing sessions that are happening. Actually, there are about three taking place next week that are happening virtually. So we encourage you to engage um, and to stay aware as to how the state is working to address the, that the climate change crisis. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to highlight uh, a few priorities of ours, um, forest conservation and solar siting. So solar siting is a term that has been recently used to really describe the challenge that Rhode Island is facing. We have limited amount of natural resources, core forests that provide value in terms of climate resiliency, but we also have the climate change crisis to face. We must transition off a fossil fuel-based economy and deploy more renewable energy such as solar, but how are we going to strike that balance and ensure that our in-state renewable energy programs are not contributing to the clear cutting of forests. So we continue to work with our partners to craft legislation um, and hopefully advance legislation that will get at that issue and provide communities the resources that they need to address that challenge. And then secondly, in terms of another priority of ours, um, we've been working to protect pollinators and their habitats. Um, we've been working specifically on a bill with Representative Kislak and Senator um, Miller, and this bill would regulate the use of neonicotinoids. And I, I try to only say that word once, um, but luckily there's an abbreviation known as neonics. And what these neonics are, are a class of insecticides that share common mode of action that affects the central nervous system of insects, resulting in paralysis and death. And why this is so important for us to be aware of is that there are contributing significantly to the decline of pollinators, and pollinators such as bees, butterflies, um, and certain species of bats and birds, for example, are essential to our food chain supply and also, and also to that ecosystem that we need to continue adapting to a warming climate. So we're getting, um, we're getting pretty close in being able to pass legislation that would regulate the use of these neonics. Um, there's pervasive use um, by I should say I should say by no fault of our own. We can find them excessively in um, shelves at Home Depot and Lowe's to take care of our lawn. So simply what the bill we are working on says is that we're going to regulate it in such a way that untrained users will not have access to these harmful pesticides because not only are they negatively impacting pollinators and killing them, but they're also harmful to pets, children, and people like you and I. So let's make sure that only trained professionals have access to those pesticides. And that's just the beginning. <laughs> there are many other classes of pesticides that we need to work to regulate. Um, so I encourage you once again to visit our booth in the back um, and you can learn more about the legislation. And again, if you go on our website, asri.org slash um, you can pull up all the information related to these bills and how you can contact um, your elected officials to let them know that you care about such policy. And in the last minute, I promise I will say that coalition work, um, as I mentioned, is extremely critical. That is why I've um, continue to lead the Environment Council of Rhode Island, working with over 60 environmental nonprofits that represent well over 56,000 Rhode Islanders to really push for these climate action um, oriented solutions. And some of our priorities this year include as a council, as a community, um, policies that are gonna help us implement the act on climate. How are we going to get to 100% renewable energy? Renewable, renewable energy electricity by 2030 is doable. We need more offshore wind to do that, to really ensure that Rhode Island can resume its leadership and deploy more offshore wind procurement. Um, a second piece of priority is an environmental justice act. We need the state to be able to identify which are these communities that are overburdened by pollution to ensure that they don't continue to be impacted by waste, um, plastic waste facilities, for example, or liquefied natural gas facilities being proposed or expanded in their communities. And how can these communities be at the decision 
making table and be heard when these facilities are being proposed. Um, so that is an example of the work that we do in coalition building. And then lastly, um, I took on the role of co-chair as Climate Jobs Rhode Island. Um, this is a partnership between labor and environmental groups working on a just transition to a green economy. And really recognizing that um, labor and environment, there's this false dichotomy that economic uh, economic solutions don't go hand in hand with climate action solutions, and that's false. Um, so we are working together to propose initiatives like Green and Healthy Schools Initiative. Why can public schools um, across Rhode Island not be um, net zero? Why can they not have the lowest carbon footprint? So we're working on um, proposing policies that will get us there. So I will stop there because I think it's been well beyond 10 minutes, but as you can see, it's really hard to condense all of this information into 10 minutes, um, but I, I encourage you all once again, to visit the Audubon table and feel free to reach out to me, um, Priscilla De La Cruz, and my email address um, is pdelacruz at asri.org if you have any questions or would like to get involved. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Priscilla. Now, please welcome Mary Ann Mayer, a member of Ocean State Poets, an author of three books, and a widely published poet. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and congratulations to the American Band. It's a wonderful day. The poem that uh, Bina and Noreen invited me to read um, is set on the Blackstone River, or in, in indigenous language, uh, Kittakuk, meaning great tidal river, or Snichtakonet, meaning rocks in and around the river. But I do feel that it's, uh, it can describe any ecosystem and riverscape um, where mi textile mills once held dominion. The, talk about renewal and growth, the Blackstone um, be, was once the most polluted river in America, with respect in the U.S. with respect to toxic sediments, and in 1998 was designated as a national heritage river, and in 2014 as a national historic park. Um, so the work does continue, um, but renewal indeed. A note on the poem: my poem is titled "Sunday Afternoon." And uh, the title references Wallace Stevens' classic poem, Sunday Morning. And also its last line, uh, the last line of my poem, belongs to Wallace Stevens' um, classic poem. Sunday afternoon. Sunday strollers on the promenade. The factories closed. The river almost blue, almost river-like. The riverbank as it should be. Elms not yet sickened, green thickness of willows. Mallards strut, iridescent. Sun turtles shine in the muck, and eel glides, luminous, past boys fishing for pickerel in the shallows. Upstream, children build rafts of sticks to watch them drift off, break apart on the lip of Pawtucket Falls. A father and son skipping stones Circles ripple one into the other as evening comes. Tomorrow, the violence again. The river goes crazy with color the mills spew into the Blackstone. It's said you can tell what the mills are doing each day by the color of the river. Mustard, vermilion, lime green, magenta on Thursdays. Branding and burning the river, heavy, heavy metals, dyes, varnishes, solvents, bleach, and a dark red poison to kill the cotton seed bug. A hot, effluent slop, raging seaward, 48 miles from Quinsigamon to Seekonk. With all the waste that perverts this river, all the measures destined for her soul. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. 
This next piece by Noreen Inglesi highlights the efforts of the Wenasquatucket River Watershed Council, which sparks economic development through their work restoring the Wenasquatucket River and surrounding communities, and by enhancing, extending, and bringing people to the Wenasquatucket River Greenway. The WRWC is a successful model of community revitalization that helps people discover this local American Heritage River and its natural resources, channeling life and economic development into neighborhoods. Here is Till the Muddy Water Flows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we now ask you to please welcome Mr. Jerry Hero, board member of the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame, for a special presentation. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Jerry Hero, and this is Al Olson, and we're here this afternoon to present the award inducting the American Band and its most famous director, David Wallace Reeves, 
into the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame for our 2020 class of honorees. The other, the other inductees are jazz saxophonist Scott Hamilton, jazz trombonist and music educator Hal Crook, and country songwriter Joe Doyle. You might have noticed that I said class of 2020. This afternoon's concert is the first time since the pandemic that the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame is able to honor any of its 2020 inductees. So I'd like to thank Brian from the American Band, Noreen and Bina from Notable Works for letting us uh, participate in today's uh, concert. We will be honoring the other inductees later this year at events yet to be announced, but this concert gets the ball rolling for us again, and we're happy to have this opportunity. Before we present the, word, the award, I'd like to say a few words about the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame and why the American band was uh, uh, honored, so honored for today. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to celebrating, honoring, and preserving the legacy of musicians, educators, and music industry professionals from Rhode Island who have made significant contributions to the national and local Rhode Island music scenes. Our two main outlets for accomplishing this mission are the Hall of Fame Museum, located in the Hope Artiste Village Factory Building on Main Street in Pawtucket, and the Hall of Fame website, where you can learn about past inductees and many other noteworthy Rhode Islanders from the detailed articles in our historical archives. Now, to the American Band. One of the earliest musical groups in the United States still actively performing, the American Band of Providence was incorporated in 1837 as a 15-piece ensemble of brass instruments and drums under the direction of Joseph C. Green, a famed soloist on the keyed bugle, a now obsolete instrument that's been replaced by valved cornets and trumpets you see today. However, the heyday of the band was during the decades following the American Civil War when it became a professional organization going out on national tours under the leadership of cornet soloist and composer David Wallace Reeves, who added flutes, clarinets, oboes, bassoons, and the newly invented saxophone to his ensemble, creating a blueprint for the sound of the modern concert band. As a composer, Reeves wrote all sorts of music for the American band, but he was known mostly for his marches, the most famous of which is the Second Connecticut National Guard March, a favorite of fellow March composer John Philip Sousa, who once said he wished he wrote it. After Reeves' death in 1900, the American band gradually became a more amateur group playing local concerts and parades. By the early 1970s, the membership had dropped and the band ceased performing until Dr. Francis Marciniak of Rhode Island College revived it in 1978. And I'm proud to say I was part of that initial group to play at that time. Dr. Marciniak led the revitalized group until his passing in 1996. Since then, the band has continued to great acclaim under the batons of two University of Rhode Island music professors, Dr. Gene Pollard, and starting in 2013, Dr. Brian Cardinet. Today, the American band is considered one of the best symphonic bands in New England, performing classical and contemporary works for winds and percussion at events throughout the region. Its 50 plus volunteer membership consists of highly skilled instrumentalists from various professions, including many music teachers. And you, dear audience, have proof of how good the music is by what you've heard so far this afternoon. And you can see for yourself why, with its long, illustrious history, this group is worthy of being so honored today. So, without further delay, Brian Cardinet, please accept this award for the American Band of Providence, inducting it into the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame for its significant contribution to the musical culture of Rhode Island. Thank you very much, gentlemen. On a family vacation in 2003, composer Mark Kemphaus had a particularly remarkable experience during his visit to Yosemite National Park. As he states, quote, 
How could any human not be profoundly moved by such stunning beauty? How could any American not take immense pride in our nation being so richly blessed with such an abundance of natural beauty? But at the same time, we Americans share a genuine concern over the dangers of short-sighted and ill-advised environmental policies of the government, as well as private sector greed with related encroachment and pollution issues." Unquote. Camp House expresses these sentiments powerfully in his composition, Yosemite Autumn.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Dragoni, a widely published poet, editor-in-chief of Crosswinds Poetry Journal, a member of the Ocean State Poets, and also a member of the Notable Works Board of Directors. What a joy to be part of this celebration today, and uh, congratulations to the American Band for such a prestigious honor. Um, and it really is a celebration of how beautiful the environment is, but uh, as Priscilla pointed out, um, the climate is in crisis. Uh, but there is hope. Um, I'm going to read two uh, poems. The first is called Hope for the World's Climate. The skies begged for enough people to worship climate scientists as if they were star quarterbacks, because too many people still thought warnings of bigger storms and hurricanes were overblown. Leaves overdried on the forest floor, threats of wildfires sparking fear in every eye that worry lived behind, wondering if they'd ignite and burn down their homes and if they'd have to watch with ashen faces. Glaciers kept losing their footing, their anchors of ice giving up. The sun's overkill, prying through cracks in the ozone, melting the Northlands at a chilling pace. Crops struggled to grow up from the soil we'd spoiled with overheating, and so many fields overthirsted, seeds poisoned as farmers lived with their doubts about a harvest drowning in drought. The stars emerged at twilight, struggling through the smog soak, unable to be seen clearly with nothing overhead to wish upon as every eye clouded and wanted to spill. But humans lived in a world under attack and so they fought back, their army growing of helpers, soldiering on, armed with arms that resolved to do whatever they could to keep healing the world maybe just picking up someone else's trash whenever they saw it, just because. And this next poem is called Banding Together for the World. I decided to join a band so I could be an instrument of change and help the world be in better harmony. I decided to protect birds of every color trilling in the forest because they remind me I can awaken and sing my song softly, or crow when I need to, or staccato away like a woodpecker towards its goal as my drumbeat sounds its resolve, measure by measure. I decided to become a bandmate so I could rehearse every We Won't Give Up song that trumpets its brave and brassy voice through the wind-filled woods, swaying and pitching the chorus of trees back and forth as if they were metronomes. I want to hear every bell ring as pure as an oboe through crisper, cleaner air so it can help tune up the whole world. I won't care what instrument I play. The band needs more players and that's enough for me to know. I want to listen to the sea too, hearing how it celebrates the waves of volunteers shoring it up, banding together as they aim to save the bay. That's why I decided to join the band. Go ahead, join me. You can be your own instrument. You don't need to make a perfect sound. You can compose a better world and clean up the discord of discarded trash. You can fix the world's broken song one note at a time. You can let your conductor be your guide. Thank you, David. Noreen Inglacy's final song today focuses on the need for all of us to come together and find ways to adapt and live sustainably in a changing climate. Here is Lend a Hand.
Sam Hazo's Exultate contains nine melodic themes that recur with different chordal structures or part of a layered thematic montage. It was written to be music for a celebration. Please enjoy Exultate.
Before our final number this afternoon, it's time for a few thank yous. First, thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon and for your support for the arts. Notable Works would also like to thank the University of Rhode Island Music Department and Chair Mark Conley for providing this wonderful venue this afternoon. Thank you also to our sponsors, such as the Helen Hudson Foundation, Bill and Peg Paolino, Cindy Drake and Randy Doherty, who are all with us today. All our sponsors make events such as today possible. Special thanks to Brian Cardinet and the American Band, as well as Priscilla Dela Cruz, our performers and poets. We'd also like to con extend congratulations once again to, to us, <laughs> the American Band, for an outstanding achievement of being inducted into the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame. And we hope that you will join us in the lobby for refreshments deliciously provided by Belmont Market, Stop and Shop, and Shaw's, and to meet members of the American Band, the Notable Works Ensemble, special guests, staff members from the Winnesquatucket River Watershed Council, and the Audubon Society of Rhode Island, as well as, as members of the Notable Works Board of Directors. We thank you once again for attending. And now known as the March King, John Philip Sousa composed more marches than any other American composer. And we like to think that we play this march just the way Mr. Sousa meant it to be played. The American Band concludes our concert this afternoon with the Stars and Stripes Forever. <laughs> 